Okay, so my goal here is to basically discuss foundations of knowledge representation and reasoning. And uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, three different topics. So the first one is uh, basically first order logic and what does first order logic semantics mean? And I will uh, convey that through a number of examples so that you have a good understanding of what does it, what does it mean to uh, write a semantic structure, what is an interpretation, and what is a model. So these are the three things that I'll try to clarify through a number of examples. Then I want to present uh, the contributions of uh, Godin. And in particular, I'll talk about uh, two results. So one is uh, Godel's completeness theorem, which was his uh, PhD dissertation. And then a year after that, he uh, did Godel's incompleteness uh, theorem. And again, I'll tell you what is their uh, significance. So now in order to sort of understand uh, the key idea behind uh, Godel's incompleteness theorem, I'm actually going to intersperse with a few paradoxes to get a sense of uh, the core idea behind uh, uh, the proof uh, that Godel came up with. So in particular, the role of self-reference. So we'll illustrate that through simpler uh, examples, uh, uh, through the logic and uh, set theory paradox before we get into uh, Godel's work. Now my goal is trying to be as informal and as example driven as possible so that you have a pretty good understanding of the foundations. And my slides actually, uh, so some slides I cooked up in the last two days and the one that I'm showing you in front of you is about 20 years old and the Godel's proofs and other things are probably 30 years old. So, and as you can see, I wrote it uh, in pen and so these are all scanned ones and someday I'll turn it into PowerPoint. <laughs> so again, uh, so let's start from a very simplistic problem. So I have, as a knowledge representer, I have a particular world in mind that I want to reason about. So I have objects and relationships in this world. And I want to seek help from the machine. So I want to encode some essential information or abstract some essential information about the current world and uh, describe it in terms of symbols and give it to a machine. And the machine is supposed to, in some sense, uh, guess what I, what I have in my mind and then uh, reason accordingly. That means whatever inferences it draws should be in sync with what I consider as acceptable, right? But clearly the same description that, that I have written could come from other people who may have a different uh, world in their mind. So how does the machine actually reason in order to make all of us happy? Who can abstract different worlds using the same uh, set of constraints, which can happen. So, so what I'm going to do is to sort of illustrate through concrete examples the situation that I just uh, 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 sketched. And then through this, I'll actually introduce all the fundamental concepts of first order logic. And then from there, we uh, build on onto what are the important problems uh, that we need to solve at the technical uh, level. Right. So, so let's start from a very simple uh, example. So let's say I have the following two facts. So Socrates uh, is a man and uh, all men are mortals. So this is a very standard example in the literature. Right. Now from there, I can uh, easily infer Socrates is a man. So I've just given you and then I'm, I'm inferring that, no big deal, right? Then given that all men are mortals, we can uh, commonsensically infer that some men are mortal, right? And then what is much more involved is something like take the first two uh, sentences and then infer that Socrates is mortal. So this requires us to combine the first and the second sentence and what it uh, sort of says. Uh, it already says all men are mortal, so why do you have to say oh, some men are mortal? No, I'm you saying that I can infer, right? I mean, I, commonsensically, if I infer that, you should be happy. 
No, it should be only all men. Why should I say some? Why should I change all to uh, some? Because I am changing what is already known. Um, no, I'm saying that if I infer that, you shouldn't be unhappy about it. I am unhappy because you now made some pot potentially, uh, you introduce uncertainty that some are possibly not mortal. Even no, he doesn't mortal. say that. He doesn't say that. <laughs> he says all men are mortal. That's that means all. To it, right? Yeah, so, so, so if some men are mortal, it's not conflicting with the fact that all men are mortal. Existential versus universal. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so, but yeah. uh, I'm, from a practical perspective, I know all men are mortal. I shouldn't say anything less than that. I should no, not, why not? I should, uh, I'm reducing, no. I'm, I'm leaving out something that I already know. Uh, no, that's not the point. <laughs> for, for, a given, for, a, for a given situation, I only want uh, that some men are mortal. But uh, actually... So why should why, why shouldn't I but, infer that? But, but when you say some more men are mortal, there is a possibility even that uh, some are not. Or that one is not. And that possibility is uh, no. Uh, inconsistent. No, it's not inconsistent. That's the point. Yeah. No, no. That How is, is that, that inconsistent? The of the men in different worlds, as Dr. Prasad. Maybe in this world, in this definition, all the men are mortal, but in another world... In so, you, so you should object to my last <laughs> sentence, which is say Socrates is a mortal. Why am I saying that? Because that is one person. I know that all. So why am I picking that person out? But from Socrates... No, you are saying, welcome. You know, Socrates is a, ma is a man, so you are welcome to Socrates as a man. So I just don't understand. I can easily say that Socrates is a man. You said that's that already. That's a fact. Right. Yeah. And because all men are mortal, I can say and, uh, so, uh, if Socrates is a man, yeah. Then Socrates is mortal. Then I know. I just don't know. Uh, some men of mo are mortal are in theory. No, that's exactly the same force. It's exactly the same force. I can't believe we're discussing this. Yeah, I know. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you're happy with Socrates, this is just the same statement without the name. That's it. So, uh, Dr. Prasad. All is not the same. Same is same. Yeah, but it's yeah, not. That's the whole point. This is much weaker. It contains. Yeah, it is weaker. Yeah. Yeah. But but you should so, be unhappy because I'm not I have not said anything that is I'm losing the information. I'm losing the information. You lost a lot of information when I said this. When Socrates is mortal, it's a lot of information gone. Only one guy survived. No, no. Because one guy didn't survive, but I didn't. all the others are also uh, saying, right? No, I can imitate all the men I know and say they are mortal. No, I think you're missing the point. Okay. No, that what I'm saying is that if you're willing to subscribe to this. If I commonsensically state this, this is consistent with this. There's okay. nothing wrong. Right, but if I have two different, let's say, spheres or worlds, yeah. in one is known that all men are mortal, yeah. in other it is known as some men are mortal. Yes. Are they saying the same thing? No. no. They're not. Okay. That means, uh, you know, you are, you know, compared to all men are mortal, you're leaving out some information. You are. And now there is uncertainty but whether somebody is a mortal or not. But no, you 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 are uncertainty. Right. Even all when it says all men are mortal, there is no uncertainty that if somebody is a man, he is mortal. No, I think that the but point you are okay. The point you are trying to make is, if I say something like Socrates is a man and some men are mortal, as one set of sentences, another set of sentences which say Socrates is a man, all men are mortal. These two sets of constraints talk about different states of the world. <laughs> but if I say this, then this automatically follows. So the Maybe it's it's anyway, it's always a loss of information. Yeah, I think when diagram, when diagram from these statements will be yeah. illustrated. Yeah, that is, that is, this one is not conflicting with this. It is not conflicting, but... Yeah, so that's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not making anything. Yeah. I'm saying that if, if, I, if I write these two, you can commonsensically infer this and and that's something that I want uh, it to be done automatically. And Maybe we can start with at least some men are mortal and then some men are mortal. It's going down a little. Okay, any variation. Okay, which if that makes it easier. Yeah, so be it. And so it's, a, it's about the inference theory, right? When you infer something, you anyway end up losing information. Uh, when you not capture the complaint. No, I don't want to say that. <laughs> this is the problem, actually. This is the this problem with all this. This is... You know, in a particular logic, uh, in mm -hmm. a logical framework, this is correct. Mm -hmm. yes. I understand that. Mm -hmm. And yet, from a very practical <coughs> perspective, you give me two sentences: "All men are mortal." That's far more interesting. You know that, that you know. Then, and give me all the uh, uh, statement that A is mortal, B is mortal. I know all of them are mortal. You know, A is man, B is man. I know they are mortal. Mm -hmm. You give me another, yeah. uh, you know, world where it says some are mortal. And no. then you see me, A is mortal, B is mortal, so A is man, B is man, C is man. 
I can't tell you whether A is mortal or not mortal. Yeah. No, that's not the point. The point is that this is... This I mean, uh, I, I agree with that question. Because I think you should say, I think you should not say some men are mortal. Statement, but you should say all men in this room are mortal. There isn't any so no, no, I think you guys are totally missing the point. I think this is going to be a non starter. I think. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is if you believe in these two, there's nothing wrong in this. This is not conflicting. Yeah, I think you're missing the point. Because you can see this. Huh? You can see this actually a statement. <laughs> Let's restart the recording. Actually, universe. No, no, this is very really legitimate that part of it. is not actually true. So th that means doesn't exist any x, which p is not. No, so exactly. No, for that. Like the right. says is so. Uh, that uh, means that uh, there isn't. I mean, if you want to say there isn't any man which is not mortal, that the statement is true. No, but some men are mortal is also true. Yeah. 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 No, no, no. Makes sense. The difference makes no, no, no. sense. No, 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 no. See, uh, can I write some? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, <that's right>. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, this is the no, so, I, everyone wants to write this one. <laughs> no, I think what the problem is that um, uh, it does lose out on the information, yes, and these theories are uh, have you know really a nice. Uh, you know, for for uh, you know, as a theory, but they no, I'm missing the point again. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing is that if if commonsensically you you should be able to derive something which is weaker than what the initial said is. Mm. Yes. You should be upset if this somehow radically conflicts with what I have said. Yeah. There's no contradiction. Yeah. yeah if there's no contradiction. No, I mean, if 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 let's say if I design a proof system that takes this as input and does not infer yeah, yeah. this, you will actually fault the proof system yeah. as incorrect. The problem is with some of these things, they are correct, yet to use less. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's not the point. Yeah. Okay. No, you're again missing the point. <laughs> if, 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 see, what, what does use less? If there is a possibility that some men are not mortal, then we have a problem. Uh, can I ask you? <laughs> in, the, yeah, in, the, in the second set, there is a possibility that some are not mortal. No, I'm not saying these are equivalent. Yeah, right. That's what I'm saying. It's just it's yeah. a legitimate I inference. Think yeah. There is right? a problem with interpretation. What Dr. Shep says is uh, when uh, we eliminate uh, these two and then we have uh, some men are uh, mortal, yeah. then there is a missing uh, part of information. But, right. but that, uh, what Dr. Prasad says is that we know all men are mortal. We don't eliminate this uh, fact. Yeah. When he says right, some exactly. men, yeah. 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 it is uh, that's the point, yes. Because some men are mortal and the other yeah, some is also mortal. <laughs> <laughs> but then you should say that. But then you should say that. No, that's what I'm saying. It's about inferences. <laughs> okay, so if you start with this, these, these are all inferences that you can make. And if you are, if you do not sanction these inferences, then I think the whole thing is gone. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if 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 you are not so this to me is common sense, <laughs> and if you don't agree, that we have a problem of a different kind. Let me know. <laughs> so, so so anyway, the, the main point is that when you when you write this in English, right? We we can commonsensically reason, but if you want the machine to reason, then you want to make it amenable to machine processing. So what we need to do is to describe this in more primitive forms that enable you to basically match pieces so that you can manipulate these two uh, representations of these two and then generate something like Socrates is man, which, uh, is mortal, which has not been explicitly given. But, but it is implicit in the way we understand these two statements. Right? Yeah. So these inference is based on the syntax or semantics because I have a similar analogy. It says like uh, I am nothing, nothing is perfect, so I am perfect. <laughs> yeah, which is fine. Syntax. It's it's syntax. I mean, eventually we want to do that, right? So so what are so basically the what is the goal of first order logic? First order logic, the way it came about is that there are some inferences that we make. What is inference? You write a bunch of of statements. And then if you understand those statements, there are a bunch of statements which do not 
syntactically look the same as the ones that I have given. They look different, but on the other hand, if you show it to anybody, they will say, yeah, this makes sense. That if I believe in the first five, I better believe in the sixth. Right? So, so I want to make explicit things which automatically come to our mind. Right? And that's the whole task of logic. But and that that's what inferences that, mean. That's syntactic, right? Because your example, you changed yeah. the referent, the grounding, yeah. for nothing. Yeah. Right? For the meaning of nothing. Yeah. That's the problem. So, the no, you, so eventually, what is the goal of machine reasoning? That is, what I'm doing in my head, mm. I want to be able to turn it into symbol manipulation. Because that's what the machine is capable of doing. Right? And so what we need to do is to take these kinds of English sentences, <coughs> break them apart into smaller chunks and f transform it in a way that is amenable to deriving these as conclusions. So we want to automate that part of the reasoning. So that's the primary. I guess it's, it's part of the reason on the spark of right, or what about the, that, uh, mm -hmm. that tool that we use in the work 3.0 class. Like if I am <coughs> the anchor of X, and oh, X yeah. is the brother of Y, then I'm the anchor of Y. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's the same. Right. Those kind of things, right? Yeah, yeah. right. It's the same yeah. Actually, regarding yeah. In my case, I think yeah. it's co conflict is there. I, in the second statement, I said nothing is perfect. Yeah. And from the first, so, I in front of I have answer I'm for perfect. you that. Actually, what you say, as you said <coughs> in your question, is the syntax here. Yeah, syntax is correct. Yeah. It's not, the it's not semantics. Yeah, it's not yeah. semantics. Yeah. Nothing yeah. in the uh, first sentence is not equivalent to the nothing in yeah. yeah. The grounding of, of nothing is different. Yeah. And you are not nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but he might be perfect. <laughs> so, so anyway, so as you'll see, basically the, the whole uh, reason for developing the first order logic was to formalize classical mathematics, such as what we do in uh, things like linear algebra, geometry, things like that in the mathematics. And also uh, reasoning, uh, deductive reasoning that, that we employ commonly. But later on, you'll see that deductive reasoning is, doesn't entirely capture the kind of reasoning that we do. And so we have something called non-monotonic reasoning. And in fact, my PhD is in the area of non-monotonic reasoning. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. Then we will, uh, OK, so, so essentially, in order to uh, describe the knowledge about the world, we need a language, right? In, in terms of which we are going to write uh, information and provide it to the machine. And then, so now when you write uh, your uh, description in terms of some uh, language syntax, you need to connect uh, that syntax with what does it stand for. So that's what is uh, called the semantics, right? And so here we will discuss uh, model theoretic semantics of, uh, of this first order language. And, and then suppose I want to do some inferences. So what is it that, that I'm trying to do? So I'm doing some symbol manipulation, right? So what kind of symbol manipulation are we focused on? So in first order logic, we are interested in what is called deduction. That means if I give you a set of axioms and you automatically jump to some uh, conclusion, then I want my symbol manipulation system to be able to derive that. So what is not explicitly given, but sort of follows uh, intuitively. Right? So that's what is the goal of deduction. Right? So that's what we want to do. So now in terms of uh, noise representation, basically what happens is we, have, we want to reason in a particular uh, uh, state of the world. And so we write essential or abstract some essential things about the world and present it to the machine. And the machine, of course, does not know the specific world that I have in my mind. So the best that it can do is to try to understand or guess at all the possible worlds that are consistent with what is given to it, and then try to uh, generate conclusions or inferences that are true in all the world, so that everyone will be happy with the inferences, because those inferences are guaranteed to be true irrespective of uh, uh, what uh, world you are uh, uh, talking about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take extremely simple examples and then introduce some basic formal machinery that uh, we typically use. 
right? So this actually was cooked up for a class. So the example that I have is actually tailored for the class, but I think we can easily figure, uh, uh, I mean, uh, understand that without uh, any, any problem. So, let, so let's say I write these four facts. So I have M of uh, Venu, F of Mary, F of Mary Allen, and then F of Barbara. So I write these four facts, right? So here there are uh, two kinds of uh, uh, entities. So I have uh, the things in, in, in red, which are basically symbols that correspond to objects in the world. And then I have uh, things in blue that correspond to, say, collections of uh, uh, objects in, in, in the world. Right? And then I'm saying that M is true of, uh, of you know, F is true of Mary, and so on. So now, so given that piece of syntax, the, in order to understand uh, this, we need to connect the syntax with uh, semantics. So let's first talk about what is a semantic structure. So semantic structure is how we abstract the word. So in the class that I had, let's say I had uh, five people in the class. So those are represented by these, uh, so this domain, right? So there are five, so these five uh, people represent uh, the, the class that uh, I had. So let's say their names are Venu, say John, David, Barbara, and Mary. And then on this, there are uh, two properties that are part of, of the world. So you have these three people are male and then these two people are female. So that's a semantic structure. So that's the state of the world I'm uh, sort of considering. Okay, now, now what the, the next thing that we need to do is, so now we have a piece of syntax. So there's M, F, Venu, Mary, and and Barbara, these are all uh, pieces of syntax that I have in my language. So I need to associate this piece of syntax with the real world uh, entities. And so that's called interpreting the language, right? So, so, so M is associated with the, with the maleness predicate, which is true of these three elements. And then F is associated with the femaleness predicate, which is true of these two. And then each of these is a map to the element. So that's called an interpretation. So every every red symbol is mapped to an element in the in the domain, and then every uh, blue symbol is mapped to a subset of the domain. Right. So that's called an interpretation. So I start with semantic structure, then I have an interpretation. So now, so so now, it, it's possible that instead of just that class, maybe. I probably I watched Fatal Attraction the day before. <laughs> so maybe Glenn Close was going on in my head. So it's possible that in my world, say the domain has uh, these four uh, characters. And again, I have a corresponding uh, maleness uh, uh, relation and femaleness relationship. So this is another possible uh, semantic structure that is also consistent with the facts that I wrote. So when I say M of, uh, uh, of David or uh, F of Barbara, what it means is that the object associated with the symbol Barbara belongs to the set associated with uh, F. Right? So that's what is how you interpret. So uh, is it not a function? No, M is a relationship. It's a unique relationship. It's a subset of the domain. Right. So similarly, there is uh, nothing stopping me from considering, let's say, instead of Glenn Close, maybe Glenn uh, Seaboard, who is actually a Nobel Prize uh, uh, winning chemist, right? So, so here we see that, that this particular element actually is a male, while this element is a female, but based on the constraints that I've written, this is not something that was uh, explicitly described. So a semantic structure can have other things. But what I describe in my specification is what is actually essential uh, to us. But if you go back to the machine, the machine has to reason in a way as to accommodate these structures too. Because it has no uh, clue of what's going on. Right? So, so now, so so I basically the way I I, I use the 
uh, use the terms, I sort of made you feel that M belongs, uh, means female, and, <coughs> sorry, M male, male and F is female. But in fact, it's possible that what I really had was, uh, in my mind, was that uh, M actually stood for a CS teacher. And if you look at uh, my, the, the class then, maybe Venu was actually an instructor in the class, while uh, Mary and Barbara were actually students in the class. So that is another possible state of the world that I might have had in my mind when I wrote those facts. And we don't have to stop that, so uh, stop there. So for example, M may have as well been Indian citizen and F have, may have been US citizens. Or uh, M may be person who is wearing uh, glasses while F may be a person not wearing glasses. Right? So the semantic structure basically can be any concrete state of the world. And the specification that I wrote is consistent with all these. So again, from machine's perspective, it has to reason in ways, so inferences that it draws have to hold uh, good in all these structures. Because it doesn't have a clue of what the person who wrote those constraints have in mind. Right. Again, I gave a very simplistic example, but that's the uh, the key thing to to uh, to understand. Uh, yeah. So in the previous case, uh, that CS teacher, we have only one element in that subset, right? Yeah. So if we give more subsets, like then uh, it's kind of like it will be taken as an inference for like M could be uh, in that set and M could be in that Indian citizen set. Is that the I mean, you basically here is the point. So you so you start with the domain. Right, so in, th in this case, there are three elements. Possible candidates for the, the relationships are up to you. So in my case, I was thinking of teacher and student relationship. So specifically, it turned out that there was only one person who was a teacher and two other people who were students. It turns out that when I interpret M as CS teacher and F as uh, CS students, it is consistent with uh, the specification that I wrote. So this is a possible model. So this interpretation does satisfy the constraints. So similarly, I have two other interpretations, right? So each of so each of these are called semantic structures. When you map when you map the symbols in the input to these uh, these actual uh, elements. They do satisfy the constraints uh, captured by the facts that I wrote down. And if it satisfies those constraints, I call them model. And the semantic structure that I'm giving you is the way you abstract real world. So we abstract real world using sets, functions, and relationships. So in this simple case, I need one set for domain. And then I have, uh, for the things in red, I needed one element in the domain. And then for the M and F predicates, they are unary uh, relations, so they are just subsets of the domain. Yeah. But the computer doesn't care whether the distinction between M and F is teacher and student, or Indian it doesn't and care. U.S. citizen, or no. respectable. No. It just knows there's a difference between these two attributes. No, but yeah. So so the point is that whatever reasoning it does needs to be consistent with all these interpretations, because. If it doesn't, then I think it is, uh, I won't be able to use it, right? So the first order logic is supposed to capture that as a notion of inference. That is, we'll later on see that we will define theorem hood. It basically says that <coughs> those theorems are those that are true in every model of the input axiom. So that's what we want to capture, right? Now, I think things can be much more uh, involved. So for example, there's nothing stopping you from imagining the world of earthworms. Maybe the, it rained the previous day and I have a lot of earthworm on my driveway, right? So here is another semantic structure that you could uh, come up with. So I have uh, three of earthworms labeled V, B, and M, and then I have maleness predicate on earthworms and femaleness predicate on earthworms. Now earthworms are hermaphrodite. And so every element uh, in the domain will belong to both these, uh, both these sets, right? 
So now my question is, do you think that this is something that I had in my mind when I wrote those facts? And the answer is yes, because there's nothing inconsistent about that, right? Then let's go the other extreme. So did the world of amoebas, uh, was that in my mind? And it turns out that uh, in the case of amoeba, we basically do not have these uh, distinctions, right? And so this was not in my mind. Right? So even in that simplistic uh, example, I was able to sort of separate uh, some semantic structures from the others. So let's go further. So based on the input, actually this is pretty simplistic, so we see that M of Venu irrespective of the interpretation will always be true. And f of Mary will always be true, irrespective of what interpretation you provide for M and uh, M and the other pieces. So we call these as theorems. So as long as the machine derives these theorems, it is in very safe territory. It's not going to upset anybody, right? But on the other hand, if you look at uh, M of Glenn and f of Glenn, then sometimes it's true, sometimes it's false. So in that case, it doesn't have as much. Uh, so these are not sanctioned by, by this unless you provide additional uh, uh, input, uh, uh, input axioms. So now, now that we looked at the world of earthworms, we suddenly realized that actually there is another model that's possible in the world of humans. Where uh, M is true of all the three elements in the domain and F is also true of all the three elements in the domain. And let's say that that was not the state of the world that I had in mind, right? So then what I need to do is to add additional uh, constraints because I, I want to throw this out because this is conflicting with what I have in mind. So that is how you sort of strengthen your uh, inputs. So here I'm going to say something like uh, that if M is true of X, of some candidate X, then not of F will be true of the same candidate. So in first order logic, the way you express that is using uh, some logical connectives and quantifiers. So the, the <coughs> equals uh, greater than, that is actually called a material implication. So what the way you read that is if F, M of X is true, then uh, not of F of X is uh, true. And then similarly, if f of x is true, then uh, not of m of x is true. And this holds, we can claim that this holds of every element in the domain. So that means we are forcing every element to be in one or the other set. Yes. Yeah. So in this case, like, those sets will be empty, right? Which one? Uh, when we uh, put these rules on those sets, then like those sets will be empty, right? No, they will be disjoint. Hmm. But, we said but that the first we one is going to be thrown away. Right? Which one? The first one. The first element. No, I mean, so so this is definitely not a model. Okay. Because when M is true of this, it has no business to be here. Exactly. So if I'm checking it in the beginning, so I will put it in that set instead of the other one. No, that's not the way you interpret. So, okay. so suppose I, I take the original four facts, I add these two rules to it. Mm -hmm. That becomes my specification of my word, right? Now, if you give me this semantic structure, it does not satisfy the constraint. So it is not a possible state of the world that I had in my mind. On the other hand, the very first uh, one that we wrote is still consistent with this. So that still is, uh, is true. So, so actually, this is a constraint on the relationship between M and F. Because I could mm -hmm. have M yeah. meaning has hair yes. and F meaning has ears, yes. right? Yes. And there's no relationship between M and F. But what, right. by adding this last piece of logic, right. now you've said there's a relationship between right. those because, two. Yeah, be yeah. Because, because hmm. see, what is my goal? My goal is, see, I have one particular world that I want to reason in. And so I describe the essential characteristics of that word and give it to the machine. Now, what can the machine do at best? It doesn't know who is right. So it doesn't know who is writing the input. So if you want, if 
if, if the machine has to reason in such a way that all the conclusions that it draws is in sync with every possible uh, model that can arise, then the only thing that it, it is truly sanctioned to do is conclusions that are true in all models. Right? And so if, if this became a potential model, and that's not what I would like to consider as viable, then the onus is on me, the representer, to write additional constraints that throws away the interpretation that I consider as not equivalent, yeah, or not uh, m -nable. Yeah. So if I uh, say m represents the male category and f the female, now I am restricting my domain, right? So I cannot use earthworms now. Right. This. Right. And but that's my purpose. Okay. So, so the point I'm trying to make is that when I write my representation, I want to capture the essentials. I do not want to lay down every property that is uh, true of my world because then it becomes too much. So I want to write only those uh, essential properties that still allows me to throw away things that I consider as uh, illegal or uh, inconsistent with what I have in mind. So, so earlier I wrote something uh, simply and I found that it was consistent with words that I did not want. And so based on the earthworm interpretation I realized that hey I am actually getting interpretations uh, like this which are also consistent with what I wrote. But that means that I am I'm basically under specifying what I want. But if I truly want to focus on, 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 the, on the information related to my class and derive meaningful conclusions, then after adding this, the earthworm uh, world went off. But, but again, clearly my goal is to actually throw away this interpretation. But I thought about this only because of that other example that I cooked up. Right? So, I mean, so that's how you, you keep refining your spec. That is, you need to make it as precise as possible so that you derive a conclusion that really matter to you because you cannot generate all possible things because that's just too many so that's where uh, the 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 debate lies okay so now here uh, so so in addition to thinking about only models that you can explicitly uh, have in the real world, now that you write these specifications, you can actually, they also support uh, all kinds of abstract models. So here, for example, I have uh, a domain like this, right? So again, if I go back to my high school teacher, she said that maleness, this corresponds to spear, and this corresponds to women because it signifies mirror, it seems. I leave it to you to figure out why. <laughs> and I'm just a messenger, so. <laughs> and uh, so, so here is a, a model that is abstract, right? So it doesn't have a real world thing. Now it's important for us to uh, reason with these models because these kinds of things further tell you what is sanctioned and what is not. So again, the noise representer is actually interested only in one model, but unfortunately the machine has to deal with all possible interpretations that are consistent with what's given. And, and that's where there is a rub. And later on we'll see that Godel's incompleteness result and Godel's complete result actually make very important distinction between uh, these two parts. Yeah. Uh, do we call a relationship a model or a set of relationships a model? A model is you, you take a semantic structure, if it satisfies all the constraints that you have written, then it's called uh, a model. Yeah. Just one question. Um, I just want to make sure I understand. So the yeah. point here is that the domain in this case is actually a set of symbols? Yeah. Okay. Just 26 uh, symbols. Say the spears and 26 mirrors. Okay. And, and then you can. Uh, Do the same. M is some subset same. of this domain, mm -hmm. F is some subset of this domain, and then you can decide whether it satisfies the requirements or not. Right? So. So now it turns out that, so this is a minor thing, I'm just going to do some little bit of name dropping so that if you are doing some formal uh, study, you'll run into these. Now it turns out that if you're dealing with something like, say, databases or, or prologue, 
right now it can't just arbitrarily cook up a domain so in in these areas we fix a domain based on what can be constructed using the symbols used in the language so you can form representations of the objects using constants variables and function symbols similarly you can form a term a, uh, the literals using predicate symbols and terms so so the special uh, domain that you can create using the symbols being used in the language is called herbrand domain so herbrand domain is that special domain that you construct using the symbols in the language of uh, uh, that you are using right and then herbrand model is a model that basically involves uh, these uh, uh, these literals so so for example uh, so the domain is just consists of v and b and then uh, the symbol we match to the string and then will be a subset of this uh, domain so later on uh, if you do formal study of uh, many of these proofs they will uh, involve these kinds of concepts okay so so this i already mentioned so i think i'm going to skip over some of the formal machinery that you need but i have basically the formal uh, language of first order logic consists of constants and function symbols and variables and uh, to interpret them yeah so so here is a simple grammar and then you have uh, well formed formulae so you start with uh, literals and then you can use and and or and negation to form uh, uh, formulae and then you also introduce uh, universal quantifier and uh, existential quantifier so i'm not going to go over these uh, details but but that basically defines the entire uh, language right and then you need to connect the language uh, symbols to and the constraints to the mo uh, to de define models and so you have uh, the notion of uh, uh, satisfaction and again i'm not going to uh, go over uh, these things but if you are interested we can uh, follow up uh, later right and then i give you an intuitive idea of what it means to be a model of a set of sentences so an interpret so you start with a semantic structure semantic structure is the way you abstract the real world so it is in terms of uh, domain functions over the domain and uh, relationships over the domain and then you have uh, the first order logic language providing you a way of uh, writing these constraints so again the and or and uh, implication are defined by truth tables in boolean <laughs> logic and then uh, we have a way of saying when a semantic structure satisfies a bunch of constraints and if it does then we say it's a model of the specification that you've written or the set of axioms that that you've written right so so those three terms i want you to have good understanding of semantic structure interpretation and then model so another important concept is the notion of theorem so a theorem is basically a sentence a theorem of an a set of axioms is a sentence that is true in all models of the sentences or all models of the axioms and uh, so the reason why we are interested in theorems is because those inferences are true irrespective of what model you have in your mind right so so that's the key key thing so let me skip over bunch of more examples okay so now what i want to do is uh, okay so now let me go back to so now let's look at uh, godel's uh, theorems and their significance so again i will try to skip over formal parts and only focus on 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 some of the key things so this particular talk was given about 30 years back so when i was a student ages back so let me skip over this so we have 
I could never find anything okay. that I did 30 years ago. Yeah. So, <laughs> so now, so one of the key things is if I give you a set of axioms, we want to try to derive all the theorems that follow. Because that could actually make our machine intelligent. Because why am I interested in theorems? Because those are things that have not been given explicitly to me. I have been given a handful of axioms. But there are zillion other things that I can actually conclude from it. In spite of all the controversies that we have. Let's say from those two, at least the other three you can conclude. Now, how do we generate those automatically? Right, and, and, and so the question is, the way I have defined theorem hood. So I define theorem hood by saying it should be true in all models. Now there are infinitely many models. So the simplistic application of my definition of theorem hood is not going to get me anywhere. Because how am I going to enumerate all the models and verify that the theorem that I have been asked to verify, in fact, uh, uh, is true in all models? I mean, that's a non starter, right? So one of the key questions was, can I design a program that can take the input set of axioms and generate all the theorems that follow from it? So that's an incredibly uh, difficult but important task. Right? So here is the key thing. So given a set of axioms, there is, a, of course, a unique set of uh, uh, theorems, and the question is, can we come up with a mechanical procedure to generate that? Okay, that was a key question. So, so what we are uh, asking for is something like this. So I, I don't know why this is. Shall I just say hi? Or? Hi, dear. Hi, dear. So, so what I'm going to start off with is, so I have a bunch of axioms and I want to generate all the consequences of these axioms. So all the theorems that follow from it. And here is a machinery that I'm allowed to use. So this machinery has two parts. So you can add additional uh, uh, logical axioms. And uh, you also need some kind of an inference mechanism, which is take two axioms and then somehow combine it. So that's called an inference rule. So inference rule in general allows us to basically take two pieces of syntax and create a third piece that may look different from where we started off with. Right? So, so now, so what we did was, so now, exactly what does inference mean or what does deduction mean so so here is how we define deduction so we say that uh, so given a set of axioms uh, gamma we can uh, derive its consequence phi we can derive a theorem phi if you can exhibit a sequence of formula on the way such that the last formulae that you have is the theorem so this uh, alpha n is same as phi. That is the final conclusion. And all the other things that precede it are either from the set of axioms that you are trying to uh, derive consequences of or these logic axioms that you are allowed to initially seed your machinery with. And so either it is one of these axioms. That means the axioms of your, of, of your uh, spec or axioms, uh, uh, the logical axiom that you are allowed to use as seeds. And if it is neither of these, then whatever uh, uh, formula you have here should be obtained from previously demonstrated uh, formulae using the rule of inference. And the only rule of inference that we have in this machinery uh, is, uh, is essentially what is called modus ponens. 
and that's actually a pretty straightforward one. What it says is that if A is known and we also know that A implies B, then you can conclude B. So which is exactly what material implication means. Right? If I know that A is true and then A implies B, then uh, B follows. Yeah. But when you infer B, then uh -huh. you will not eliminate A and A... Uh, You're not in eliminating anything. So it is like the first example that we have. Yeah. B would be true. Some, right. some men are yeah. more right. true, but you will not eliminate A. No, you're not eliminating anything. Yeah. Right. So, in fact, so the point that we are trying to make is that you have been explicitly given only gamma. And you are generating all possible syntactic forms that look different from gamma, but you are definitely going to believe in their uh, uh, truth. Because if you are going to subscribe to gamma, you are not going to say, no, I don't agree with this. So, so the way the deduction missionary has been defined is to capture that. That is, what are the things that are obvious, that obviously follow from the initial set? And that was the goal of this entire missionary. Right? And so, so that's what a deductive proof is. So this is also called a monotonic logic because essentially what happens is the proof of one is completely dictated by what came before it. And if I add to the initial set of axioms, you can only grow the set of theorems, right? If I add 10 new axioms to gamma, then I have more things to add uh, as a proof. At the minimum, you can put 10 new things uh, as uh, immediately proved, right? So that's what makes the first order logic monotonic logic. That means if the set of axioms increase, then the set of theorems also increase. The common sense reasoning is actually not monotonic. So there are fragments of deductive reasoning that is monotonic. The classical mathematics does monotonic reasoning. The common sense reasoning or something like your closed world assumption that you use in databases is actually non-monotonic. And so my PhD was actually in the area of non-monotonic inheritance. So it violates uh, this particular rule. So there, if you add a new axiom, you will actually withdraw existing conclusions. So that makes things uh, quite complicated. OK, so, so what Godel did was to actually come up with this machinery. So he figured out exactly, in addition to the, the gamma that we have, which is the problem-specific axioms, he came up with this generic set of axiom schemas. So all the tautologies, that means which are like your propositional uh, 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 statement which are uh, true, plus where alpha actually stands for uh, some well-formed formula. So any, any formula that kind of pattern matches with these, they are all uh, called logical axioms. So given this set of logical axioms and exactly one inference rule, which is the modus ponens that I talked about. So, so if you start with your problem-specific axioms, add to that uh, the logical axioms and then use this uh, one inference rule. Using that and uh, our notion of proof, whatever consequences that you, that you generate, so that is guaranteed to be a theorem. So what Godel proved was he first developed this entire machinery, saying that here is uh, the the inner uh, workings of this machine. And, and then what he did was to, to basically prove two important results. So first is called the soundness, second is called the completeness. So in soundness, what he is basically saying is that if a formula is generated by my machinery, 
then it is guaranteed to be a theorem. That means it does follow from what's given. So that's your sanity check. So we want to make sure that whatever, uh, if you believe in the original set of axioms, then whatever this generates is guaranteed to be true. So that's the minimum requirement that we want. Now the much more difficult uh, task to accomplish is the completeness. That means anything that can follow from this set of axioms will show up as the output of this machinery. And that's an extremely difficult task to achieve and to prove. And, and that's what he uh, basically got it done. So you can always generate a subset of uh, theorems, no big deal. The fact that you generate every possible uh, theorem through this process is the, he, he was a daunting task. And that's what he accomplished in his uh, uh, PhD dissertation work in 1930. Isn't it an infinite set, though? I mean, yeah. You can always add and. Right. So, <laughs> so, so because uh, the set of theorems is potentially infinite, so the guarantee that you have is that the machinery will eventually generate. So you wait long enough, you will find it. So that's the best guarantee that you can expect, because it is infinite in nature. Now, another consequence of uh, if you go further into the nature of these theorems, if let's say, if, if a theorem is, uh, so, so if, if something is a theorem of a set of axioms, it is definitely going to show up in the enumeration. Suppose something is not a theorem. Am I guaranteed to get an indication that something is not a theorem? And the answer is no. That is, at any point, just because something has not showed up could either mean that it is not a theorem or that I have not waited long enough. So, so again, if you know the jargon in computability, the set of theorems is recursively enumerable but not recursive. The, what that means is that if it is a theorem, it will definitely show up. If it is not a theorem, it will definitely not show up. But if it is not a theorem, it is not going to give me any idea where I can say for sure that, hey, this is not going to show up and I don't need to wait any longer. Because for a general case, both the options are open. That is, something hasn't showed up because you haven't waited long enough versus something hasn't showed up because it is never going to show up. So that we cannot decide uh, for sure. So that's the nature of theorems. So it is only one way decidable. So if it is a theorem, it will show up in the enumeration. If it is not a theorem, it won't finitely fail and, and tell you. If it does, you're lucky, but there are no guarantees. But if it is a theorem, you're guaranteed to find it if you wait long enough. So patients will help. In the other case, patients may not help. Right? So do you understand the difference? Okay. So that is his uh, uh, PhD work. Okay. So now what I want to do is to move to. Okay. Now I'm going to consider. Uh, so to understand uh, Godel's incompleteness work we also need to get a little hang of uh, self-reference, which is the cause of number of problems. So what I'm going to do is to show you a few simple paradoxes to get a handle on what is the, the key, uh, key idea that we need in order to appreciate uh, the other result. So let's start with uh, a, a very simple one. So this is called liar's paradox. So it just says uh, this is a lie. And so there is a self-reference there. So the statement is talking about itself. So now, if you think it is uh, true, and then try to understand what is it that the sentence is saying. 
then you will come up with a conclusion that the assertion is actually saying opposite of of what uh, what we just concluded right now in traditional mathematics we actually use this uh, as a means for proof by contradiction right so you you try something you assign a value true and then you follow through the reasoning and then you come up with a contradiction so that's called uh, reductio ad absurd and then when you run into a contradiction what do we say we say oh maybe the other option is right right so i tried true it didn't work so in binary logic the only other option i have is false and so i sit back and say okay this is false and move on and usually we don't even bother verifying that but in this particular case if you now assign saying this is lie is actually a false then it turns out that it's actually saying the correct thing and so what happened was irrespective of what truth value you assign it is backfiring and so in reality what is happening is this is a peculiar uh, statement that doesn't sort of is not amenable to a truth value assignment now a similar situation actually occurred in a different context in the in the development of set theory so around the turn of uh, last century so so russell and whitehead what they were trying to do was trying to basically axiomatize mathematics so their goal was that if you let people reason informally in english one can do a lot of hand waving and there are subtle mistakes that we can make so their goal was to try to pin down all the gory details so as to get rid of common sense and the details are I mean, so acute that even a machine can potentially carry it out or machine check so so one of the thing that in the process of doing that was they were trying to define formally what sets are and a way of defining set is by using what is called set comprehension so in set comprehension what you do is you describe the property that elements in the set will satisfy and you dis you define this through a first order logic uh, sentence and then if the if if that number satisfies the requirement imposed by the first order logic sentence then you put it in the set and if it makes that false then you say it belongs to the complete right so again i think a similar thing appears in uh, let's like say haskell and scala where you do list comprehension so again you do the same thing right so you have a way of generating elements and then you test it so now so what they did was uh, they innocuously considered a collection like this so let's consider a set of sets that do not contain themselves so so now does that look sort of weird so so the answer is first let's ask ourselves the question so can you come up with a sing one set that doesn't contain itself and then the answer is of course i can right what's the big deal so just take empty set does it contain empty set of course not right so that's one example so let's take uh, set abc does it contain the entire set abc of course not right let's take a set of natural numbers does it contain the whole set of natural numbers of course not right it just only contains numbers not the whole set itself right so there are ample uh, there are ample examples of collections that do not contain themselves so what they said was hey let's try to define a collection that just pulls these all together into one big big collection right so they defined a set like this so they said r is a collection of sets that do not contain themselves so that's what this is saying so this is a true or false uh, kind of predicate right so so this says x does not belong to x right and so i just gave you three examples there where this is true so i know at least three things are in the set right and you can of course come uh, create a zillion others uh, pretty easily so so they wrote this and they said okay so here is a nice collection i have defined right so now let's ask a very fundamental question 
So what is the status of uh, R in here? So in binary logic, so some so think about how we define set. So something either belongs to the set or it belongs to its complement, right? I mean those are the only two options we have. So the question is, let's take the collection R. Does that fall within R or outside R? So that was a simple question they asked. So let's carry out the reason, uh, reasoning. So does R contain itself? So, so if R contains itself. Then, look at this. So what is this saying? This is the property you must satisfy to belong to R. If R does belong to R, that means this test to enter uh, this gate is false. So you don't have the right key to enter that door, right? So that means the, the red R cannot be within the green R collection. I mean, red and R, I'm just taking, making a distinction just to sort of clarify things, right? So then you, so because based on this, this criteria is failed. This criteria is not satisfied. So that means R does not belong to R. Right, so, so R is in the complement. So then, by your proof by contradiction, let's say R does not belong to R. Maybe that's a viable uh, choice that we can pursue. But if you pursue that, then it again backfires. So now it is forcing us to say R belongs to R. And we already saw that that's giving us trouble. So, so what we are in, in eventually concluding is that R belongs to R if and only if R doesn't belong to R. And, and that's uh, something that we can't live with. Right? So, so what does that really mean in concrete terms? So to explain that, what, did, what Russell did was to try to come up with something that, uh, that normal humans like us can better understand. So he came up with something called Barber's Paradox. So it is stated like this. So the village barber shaves those who do not shave themselves. And the question was, uh, who shaves the village barber? And, and it turns out that if a village barber shaves himself, if and only if a village barber doesn't shave himself. So that's the kind of, it's a basically the same reasoning done in this more commonsensical uh, setting. And so in that case, what we conclude is that such village barbers do not exist in our world. But actually, barber shape is not a set. It's not a definition for a set. Yeah, I know, but it's just a this is, I mean, if you really want to go, then, then you can just take the final conclusion can, and move on. You can have it uh, actually yeah. set of customers of our Yeah, I think we can go over that later sometime. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, the basic point is that if you, so, so the, the key point is that, that if you, if you arbitrarily impose some criteria, then the exist just because you wrote a criteria doesn't imply that there are uh, objects in the world that satisfy it. And so here is a criteria that I wrote, but we find that such things may not exist. And that's exactly what happened when we defined uh, R. So we arbitrarily wrote some syntactic definition, but we actually realized that that's not something that we can actually meaningfully satisfy. So, so that was uh, the resolution, and 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 then uh, people realized that uh, the sets themselves have to be constructed in very careful way. So you start with axioms, and then systematically build uh, hierarchy of sets and things like that. So that's what led to uh, problems. And in fact, uh, because of some of the surprises that they got in formalization of sets, there was actually a whole lot of work in the theory of programming languages in the in the 50s and 60s to put that in on firm foundation to make sure it doesn't have any lingering uh, paradoxes and so on. So that's what was the work, work by Dana, Scruz, uh, Scott Scrachy and Scrachy and so on. Okay, so so again the, again, the point that I'm trying to make here is that when you have self-referential constructs, 
and especially in the presence of negation, you will have all kinds of problems. And in the Godel incompleteness uh, situation, we are actually going to exploit that to understand the limitations of mechanical systems. Okay, so, so let me uh, get to the two contributions. So the first one I already mentioned. So, so the first was Godel defined a proof system that was sound and complete that would enumerate uh, all valid statements in all models of a set of axioms. So that was the first thing that we already discussed. Now, Godel's incompleteness theorem focuses on a single model of arithmetic. So he's only concerned about numbers. And he's interested in uh, numbers with zero successor function plus function times and uh, less than relationship. So we are interested in describing, uh, we are interested in a language that contains these as primitives. So we are interested in understanding properties about plus and times and, and, and less than. So in particular, what we want to do is the following. So we want to form uh, logical sentences and see which ones, so, so, so given a model or given a semantic structure and a logical sentence, it is either true or false, right? And, and so what we want to do is, we want to see if you can enumerate all the sentences which are true of arithmetic. So that's what we want to do. Can I write a machine that generates all the true statements uh, uh, about uh, natural numbers? So that was the goal. And what he basically showed was that doing that is impossible. So that means there are, that is, you cannot write programs that can enumerate exactly all the true statements. That means Whatever mechanical system you, you, you design, there will be some truths that we will know, but the machine will not. So that's the uh, thing that he tried to demonstrate. Now in order to do that, so here are some key ideas. So the first key idea is, uh, as we will see, we will make, uh, we will need to associate because we can only talk about numbers and we'll see that we may want to actually talk about formulae. And to make that happen, he introduced the idea of Godel numbering. So with every statement, we can associate a unique number. And, and here is a simple way of doing that. You just take a statement and then uh, find its ASCII representation. That's it, that big uh, uh, ASCII number that you uh, get, you can say that is a Godel number. So in the same way that with every program you can associate uh, a number, right? So that's pretty simple to, to do. So the second thing is that once you're able to associate a wet form formulae with a number, we can actually make every relation we can define through this language talk about two things simultaneously. So it can either talk about numbers or indirectly talk about sets of formulae. Because every number has a second uh, uh, meaning, right? So you can view something as saying a subset of sentences and equally well, you can also regard uh, a set of formulae also as being uh, represented as a set of numbers. So you can give this dual uh, uh, interpretation. So you can say, basically try to amalgamate the language and the meta language, right? So some, these are some of the key ideas that he used. Okay, this will be a little harder to appreciate, but I think we need that to kind of better understand what, uh, what he did. So, so once he got this uh, dual uh, uh, thing, he, sort of engineered a, a, a proof system and some formula in such a way that, that whatever a proof system derives, 
will conflict with whatever that conclusion is. So the conclusion that you derive actually says something which is opposite of uh, what happened. So, so the two levels actually do not match. So if you derive something, then the so so you can you can derive uh, a formula in your proof system, and at the end, if you look at what you derived at, at, at the level of what it encodes, it actually says uh, something opposite. So if at the if the proof system explicitly derives alpha, and then you look at alpha under a microscope in terms of what that uh, thing is encoding, it will say not alpha was this uh, was derived. So effectively what happens is that you have an object language proof that actually conflicts with what it can what it corresponds to at the meta language uh, level. So that's the thing that he instrumented. I mean that is a very uh, important uh, step that uh, that he accomplished. And and so because of that you can see that if you are able to derive that sentence, then you basically have a, also a proof of the negation of that, which makes the system uh, inconsistent. And 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 so so basically what so effectively what he said is, if you really guarantee that the original proof system is consistent, then this could not have happened. Right? I don't know whether I'm making sense. So. So again, I, I don't think you'll understand the mechanics and I'll probably briefly tell you how, how he set it up. But essentially the point to understand is that he created a particular uh, formula if, if that can be proved in your system, then you have at a different level a proof of its negation. And in first order logic, if you can prove alpha and not alpha, then you can basically prove any garbage. You can prove every sentence in the, that you can construct in the language. So for any arbitrary alpha, you can create any arbitrary uh, not alpha. Right? Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about that word consistency? So do you mean consistency? Yeah, so when I say, yeah, so consistency means, uh, so a system is inconsistent if it can generate both alpha and not of alpha. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is that I'll create, I'll, I'll create a, a sentence. If it is proved, then by the virtue of the way that sentence was constructed, you can also have a proof of not of alpha. So because we claim that our system is consistent, such a thing cannot happen. That is, you basically get a package deal. Mm -hmm. So either you get none, or you get alpha and not of alpha together. And because we are claiming that uh, we are never going to have an inconsistent system, that means that alpha better not be derived. Because if alpha derives, then it's an evil twin also gets in. <laughs> so that's the thing, right? So, so what does that actually imply for us? That means if our system is consistent, which is what we require, right? Because the moment you introduce inconsistency, I mean, it's bogus. There's no point in having that. I mean, as well right now, articles which say yes for everything or no for everything. So. So if, if the system is consistent, that means it can not, neither generate alpha nor can it generate not alpha. Now as far as a model is concerned, alpha is either true or false. There is not, no in between. It's, it's either it is true, in, a statement is true in the model or not true in the model. So that means we know one truth, right, we either know alpha or not alpha, one of them is true, so we know one truth which uh, did not get generated, right, so that's the incompleteness. That means there is no way that you can generate all possible truths mechanically because there will always be something missing and the thing that is missing is what he actually constructed. So. And, and the peculiar thing is, okay, suppose I discovered one uh, truth that it cannot generate. Can I just take this and make that an axiom? Nobody's stopping me from saying, okay, this one from now onward we say is true. 
So let me add that as an axiom. Unfortunately, if I add that as an axiom, then the way that whole uh, proof that he has has been set up, it creates yet another uh, a new formula that is now true, which is not in the enumeration. So it's actually a creative process. So there is no way to complete it. So just because you discovered a new thing, if you put it back, it's not the end of story. Because now you created yet another one that you need to deal with. And it's a never ending story. So that's why it will remain uh, basically uh, complete forever. So uh, yeah. So uh, actually regarding reasoning, I mean this issue, mm -hmm. that means um, once we are running reasoning, mm -hmm. we come up with a couple of actually new axioms. Mm -hmm. So hey, new theorems. New theorems. New theorems. Yeah. So I mean. Uh, we should, I mean, regarding consistency, mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense that uh, one by one axiom should be added to the knowledge base and again the reasoning is wrong, or the whole of this bunch of new axioms should be added. And no, no, what I'm saying is that, so, so basically, <laughs> so the way we started off was we, so, so the way we started off, I mean, actually, I mean, see, for this you need to actually look at the proof because, See, all this is at the hand-waving uh, level. And actually, I'll, I'll, if you look at my slide, you'll get the next level of detail, but, but you still need to go and look at logic books to figure out all the details. But, but essentially, what we are saying is that you, you start with, with some, some collection and, of yes. uh, so, uh, so truths, truth. then you will create a new sentence no. that we know is true but doesn't belong there. Okay, if we come up with a couple of Yes. So, I mean, if we add all of them at once, maybe knowledge will become inconsistent. But if we add, I mean... No, it won't become inconsistent. Even if it doesn't become inconsistent, what we are saying is that as you keep changing the input set, it will create yeah, additional, yeah, it will create additional formula that will uh, no longer... so. So this basically, there is no catching up. It, you lo this process is creative in the sense that it is always one step ahead. And that's why there is that incompleteness. So that's the problem. So I, I think I'll probably briefly show you. So I mean, these are some uh, illustrative examples of how the same thing can be looked at in two different ways. So here I can describe it as so birds flying right or birds flying left, and if you make them the same color, then that ambiguity persists. Or here you can view this in two ways, right? You can either think of a cube here or a cube here, and you get two interpretations. So basically, what I'm trying to get at is these are the way to visualize that same thing can be interpreted in, in, in two possible uh, ways. So here are... Uh, the current uh, topics and again you interpret the same thing in two different ways right so again coming back to okay so okay so let me provide a little more uh, information on uh, the incompleteness part, but again, okay, this was the last slide, maybe I forgot. So, so in the previous one, I basically said uh, the first result is completeness. And here is actually an exercise that you typically do in your uh, linear algebra class. So for example, uh, there will be a question in, in, in groups chapter saying, if uh, all the elements in a group are idempotent, then prove that the group is abelian. And you can basically cast it as uh, a problem in first order logic. And this can be automatically demonstrated. Okay, so now I'm going to briefly share what the second order logic, uh, what Godel did for a second uh, result. And if it goes heavy going, then we'll revisit it later.
So, so basically, for the incompleteness result, he focused on a single model, that is the model of arithmetic. So we are only interested in numbers and operations on numbers. So this is in contrast with Google's, Google's first uh, completeness result where we are reasoning in all possible models of an axiom, of a set of axioms. So now we're interested in truth that we want to discover about a single model and in particular the model of arithmetic. Okay, so now, we can uh, do that uh, to different degrees. So you can just uh, look at what you can say about numbers using zero successor function and equality operation. Then you can extend it to less than operations. Then you can extend it to plus. Then you can extend it to also include multiplication. It turns out that if a language is not very expressive, then we can do a lot of nice things. But it turns out that if you have less than, plus, and, and times and equals in your language, then the language is just too uh, very expressive for us to be able to do things mechanically. That means we are unable to enumerate the truths with respect to this language uh, using the machines that we have. So that's the limitation of uh, what can be mechanized. Right? So in order to uh, prove that, so, so what he wanted to show is that you can write sentences using these, so each sentence is either true or false in, uh, in, in the model of arithmetic. So there are no two things about that. So it's either true or false. So the question is, can I enumerate only the true statements? <coughs> and only and all the true statements. That means can I enumerate 50% of them and can I draw that line properly, right? So that's the, the general uh, goal. So, so what he did was, uh, so Godel basically showed that uh, such a thing is impossible. So I'm going to basically tell you exactly how we went about doing that at a very high level. So the first thing that he uh, did was to say that in order to prove this result, we want to focus on what kinds of relationships can be expressed using this language. So what kind of relationships can we define in this language? So the more expressive the language, the more uh, complex relationships we can uh, define, right? So, so, so let me give you a very simple example of what do we mean by defining a relation. So, so let's say you, you want to define a set of even numbers. So you write something like there exists an x, x plus x equals y. Right, so this is a relationship that has one free variable y. And, and so this allows you to define the set of even numbers. So something like that is what we try to do. So, so you say that a, a relationship is definable in a uh, in this model, if you can basically describe or write a, a first order formulae that has the appropriate number of, of, of variables. So now what he did was, uh, uh, was the following. So he was not really interested in defining relationships about numbers, but rather he wants to, to define relationships involving uh, formulae, right? But he could, he could only define relationships about numbers, but he was interested in defining about uh, formulae. So what he did was to make use of this Godel numbering concept. So given a big formulae, you just take the binary representation or ASCII representation and find a number associated with that. So now you can basically view the collection of uh, formulae as a collection of numbers and vice versa. So you can, if you can define a set of numbers, you can also try to think of it as defining a subset of formulae, right? So that's the kind of duality uh, that he tried to capture. So normally what happens is you can, uh, 
So given a sentence, you, you map it to true or false value. And then if you have a, a statement that has some free variables, then you can define relationships. And now what you're doing is we are trying to basically uh, combine the, the formulae and the number. So we are trying to have this dual uh, uh, relationship. Right? So we are going to exploit uh, that. So now the next question is that, so now that we are interested uh, in defining relationships among uh, formulae, what kind of relationships are useful for his end goal? So what he did was to try to define relationships that are associated with proofs in the system. So it turns out that uh, the, the language that involves uh, times and uh, uh, and uh, plus and so on is powerful enough to actually describe uh, the the deduction in the system. So this one will probably require a lot more work for uh, you you to see. So so that's the kind of relationship that he he focused on. And uh, and then what he did was to make use of this deducibility relationship and uh, self-reference and negation. So negation, self-reference, and deducibility, he tried to uh, tie it all together to actually get the job done. So specifically what he did was the following. So, so let us assume that uh, you can define some uh, relationship of the following kind. So suppose you have a set of numbers and these numbers correspond to all the formula that are necessarily true in the model of arithmetic. So let's call that uh, uh, that as, uh, so A is the set of formula that, so A is the set of formula that are known to be true in the model of arithmetic which we can enumerate and uh, we create this, uh, uh, we, we create this uh, set of their Godel numbers. So what he did was he basically was able to construct uh, another formula sigma, so which he was able to show cannot be deduced uh, uh, from A. So, so A is the set of formula that are that contains formula that are guaranteed to be true in the set of natural numbers and he was able to construct a sigma that you cannot uh, derive from it. And uh, so once we, he was able to instrument that, then he was able to actually uh, show that that's the, that's the formula that we know is true but cannot be uh, automatically uh, derived. And, and so I have actually details of what that, uh, so, so here is the, the kind of sigma that he constructed. So the sigma that he constructed basically says the following, that a sigma is not a theorem of A. And so if you are able to derive a, a sigma through A, then you have created a, uh, a conclusion that is actually false. And so you obviously cannot generate falsehood from uh, all the statements that are known to be true. So that's where there is a conflict. So that means A cannot be deriving uh, uh, sigma. So sigma is a truth that we know that you cannot uh, derive from A. So that's the line of reasoning. And uh, so I have actual details about exactly what that uh, sigma is that I'm not going to go over. But basically, you, you have some three-step process that actually tells you how to construct uh, that, particular, uh, uh, that particular formula that, you, that has basically dual reading. So on the one hand, if you prove it, then what it is saying is exactly the opposite of what you just did. And, and so, so that's basically how the whole uh, thing works. So, so in terms of uh, enumerating the truths in this, you do not even have the kinds of things that we had for theorems. 
So in the case of theorems, I guaranteed that the machinery will, you wait long enough, the machinery will generate the theorem. So in here, even that guarantee is missing. That is, I cannot even tell you that if you wait long enough uh, with patience, the truth will eventually show up. So even that doesn't happen. So that's the good as incompleteness. So again, what I suggest is that this part is a little harder. So look at my PowerPoint and see if uh, that makes sense, because that's actually easier to uh, follow. And then if you really want uh, to read some uh, informal accounts of this, then Godel Escherbach is a good place. And there's another uh, book called uh, Godel's Proof. And this was, uh, I think, written by Ernst and Nagel or something. I think it's probably Chicago Press or New York Press or something like that, New York University Press. It's a pretty old book, some 1950s book. So they small. have some informal uh, description. And it's a pretty small book. Yeah, it's a small book, yeah. And then if you really want uh, all the gory details, uh, then you can start with the slides that I have and then uh, look at Enderton's, uh, Enderton's book on, on logic. One more yeah. dimension to this is probably uh, knowing Cantor's diagonal slash argument and then how did this uh, depart, took a departure from that probably. Yeah, that, yeah, that is for a slightly different uh, purpose, but diagonalization is also has some element of separate. Yeah. So, when I think about the kind of data we deal with and the kind of things we do, what is the implication of all these things, including anything that we learned in first order logic and... Uh, no, I think uh, the first order logic basically underlies all the stuff that you've done in mathematics so far. In mathematics, yes. Right. But, uh, okay. I, I think the way to look upon is that the fact that we have all these uh, things gives you the feeling that, yeah, I think mathematics has pretty good foundation and... See, the thing is it's that not, if you... It's a foundation, it's not very useful. No, what is for, useful to you... today's data science. No, the, see, it is not useful in the following <coughs> sense. Be, because they showed that these kinds of things are impossible to do, you're not going to attempt it. But somebody has to show that this is... So, so I'm not going to say that every common man has to necessarily understand all the things, but somebody has to do it. But they're not applying it to today's data processing. No, it's a question. No, what do you mean by not applying? Okay, tell me how. No, you know, the question is that suppose some of these results were positive, then you would have applied it. But the fact that they have said these cannot be done, you will say, okay, I'm going to shy away from it. That's right, but then that's why they have found uh, statistical techniques to deal with this. No, again, uh, see, if, if you're going to solve a simple problem, you're going to have a simple solution. Why do you want to complicate life? I don't expect you to complicate life. But if you have this grand problem, now you are saying, hey, what forget grand it. problem? Not... You're just, uh, you know, you get the, comp you know, just doing arithmetic kind of uh, language is too complicated here. What done problem? No, that basically means that, hey, this, this simplistic problem itself is hard to do. Exactly. So, in practice. So, so there's no use in... Why yeah. no, I mean, oh, yeah, no use? Language. No, when we say solve, uh, what do we mean yeah. by solve is the question. Uh, do we mean to give a theoretical solution or do we mean to give a heuristic-based solution? Heuristic, uh, anything that uh, a human can use. I don't know. No, human can use, right? You can use this. <laughs> because, because you proved this, you're not going to break your head and design such a thing. But because you're a, saying uh, you're... It's not just hope. that. You are, it's a representation, and representations are useful, but they're limited, and you have to understand right. the foundations on which those representations are built. And what we're hearing here are, are some of the limitations, some of the issues. But right. it doesn't mean representation is a bad thing, any more than a map right. so, is a bad thing. So, for example, you might justify by saying that, okay, the whole old business is because they are interested in tractability and things like that. But the fact that... Is it useful? No, yes. well, no, what I'm saying why? Is why is it so? No, what, what no, no Saida, what, what use have you gotten? Tell me. No, what does use mean? Me I mean, personally? if this were possible, I would have done it. No, uh, me personally, but plenty of you. I mean, this was, this was the foundations of doing um, planning for the Mars rover, for example. 
it was a computationally based system. Was it limited? Were there issues in the interpretation of the symbols and the, and the semantics of the symbols and how they were related to each other? Absolutely. But was it helpful to articulate our assumptions, our axioms, and derive theorems? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. Let, let, me, let me tell you why did I go over all this. Okay, so let me show you my first paper. <clears throat> okay, and, and let me t tell you exactly what was the state of affairs then and what did I do about it. So, so, so let, maybe I'll, 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 I'll skip a little bit, but so in, in common sense reasoning, right? So common sense reasoning does not follow your first order logic. So instead of uh, reasoning in all models, we reason in minimal models. Now it turned out that to capture minimal model, McCarthy came up with something called circumscription, and which is a second order formula. And so there was a lot of uh, uh, work uh, going towards, can I take the second order formulation and then turn it into first order logic? And in, in the realm of that, actually that was actually a giant step. So if I describe the minimal model using just first order representation, we can do a lot more than if I had to actually go to higher uh, second order logic and there are all kinds of problems. So then what I discovered was that I, I used all these encodings and we actually found that even if it is expressible in first order logic, you cannot actually compute it. And so, so that required us to encode. Is it, uh, wasn't it already um, uh, intuitive that second order, you know, uh, problem that requires you to represent in using second order logic uh, just should not be tried in first order no, that, that was a problem. No, I mean, that was not intuitive. No, intuitive in the sense that if I can express the solution to the second order problem in I mean, terms of... The only of reason you had to use second order to express uh, it is the fact that first order was not adequate, uh, whether for expression or computation. No, that was not true. Ba basically... Is that, is that true or not now? No, wait. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is that, so the general problem is where you have a second order constraint. Now there is a subset that you can identify for which you have a first order solution. That subset becomes usually useless. Or no, too, I'm, too I'm saying it works. That you can derive the first order subset and there were papers on that. There and papers what I said was that None even, of them are useful. Uh, used. No, but even if you can do that, which was actually considered a good thing, it was good you have computational uh, part, which is what I ended up uh, showing. That even if you can describe it in first order logic, you won't be able to figure out exactly which one to pick. Why is that useful? Those are good results which say that, hey, don't go here. So <laughs> no, you're basically well, saying nobody negative will results. go there anyway. No, you won't go there because you don't want to go there or so you don't go there. It was not enough to there. represent the complexity of the real no, problem. No, uh, no, I don't I, buy I that. I understand your argument. You're saying that no, just because representations that. are not perfect, that they're... That they're no, they're not adequate. No, no I, I don't okay. go there because I don't want to do it, which is a different story from I don't want to go there because I'm going to fall in a pit and there's no hope. Yeah, there is, <laughs> I want that yeah. Showing that there is no solution. Yeah, is a bigger it's a, it's a bigger result. I mean, if, if somebody builds a system tomorrow assuming that this, is, right. this can be done, then they'll go and fall in a bigger issue versus knowing that it cannot I think I would just not go this logic way I mean, I'll, I'll take heuristic no, way I'll take statistical no, if you way don't want to go, no you don't want to do the problem that's a different story but if that is a problem that you're interested in then these results are actually useful no but the heuristic has its own restrictions right you you cannot prove it for every case one thing I want to add yeah. Actually, first order logic and this kind of a stuff is basic of artificial intelligence. Yes. So all of the all story of, of artificial intelligence. <laughs> and the yes. and, uh, no, the thing why is don't you Why don't you show me a good connection between uh, you know recurrent network uh, neural network and this? No, thing. the clarity that that you get out. Why don't you show me that? Show me any uh, write up on that, and I will you know pay more attention. Okay, so maybe hmm? we can prepare no, something. No, our whole system. purpose of. Are we doing this all the time? How? Oh, ontological reasoning that I have seen are useless. 
No, but no, 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 but I mean, they, they, they all, all, you know, the best use, the best use I have seen, uh, those reasoning are to say my knowledge base is consistent. That is the best use I have seen so far. No, no we do this all the time. No, no wait, wait. I, I have a different reason for you. So, for, for example, so, so forget about reasoning. No, forget about, forget about uh, uh, using machines to reason. The, the fact that, that you're introduced to this concept and using that to even clarify your writing. So let me give you a concrete example of, let's say, writing a language reference manual. Mm. The language reference manual is written in English. Mm. But in order to write rigorous uh, uh, thing and being able to analyze, actually people are using concepts which are from the formal training. You probably don't write uh, Greek and Latin in the description that is meant for public at large. Mm -hmm. But in order to make sure that you organize your thoughts well, consider all cases and, and ferret out all the uh, nitty gritties, right? Having some of the formal training is actually useful. And to that extent, I think people should be introduced to first logic kinds of things. Now, if, if your point is that, hey, I'm going to use uh, these theorem provers for uh, day-to-day -day things, probably not. Maybe we are, but the fact that there are negative... I, 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 I solve problem, real world problems, right? Hey, these are real world problems <laughs> too. <laughs> Except that you are real world problems. You can't solve it. All the toy things and then you say this is unprovable, you know, either unprovable no, or unprovable. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. If, if you are yeah. only wanting to do one plus one equals two, then you don't need it. No, I mean, <laughs> the, the whole building of programming languages started, started with this uh, computability first order logic. And, and, and tell me about proving the correctness of a program, uh, real world uh, program. No, not everyone. What has been, well, tell, me, tell me where in software verification or program verification, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, this has been, uh, you know, able to do with any real world size program. Tell me. No, but I mean, no, you, no, that is because I, of some problem that I just mentioned to you. Huh? It's, it's been proven that you cannot do that. Yeah, exactly. So that is why. So don't attempt it. Go heuristic way. That's what it says then. Right. It just says it's wrong. That we learned a long time ago. No, that even for simplest know. problem, it is, uh, you know. So you have to choose between whether right. you want to go a theoretical way or a heuristic Almost way. Almost always you have to go uh, heuristic no, way. For any, no. for any practical program verification, you have to go, you know. Even if you're what, what, using this for heuristic the, purposes. So people in the software verification have been working, you know, banging their head for a long time. And no. I know of very little work, I know real useful work. No, there are no. millions of dollars that government funded no, I, I know, I'm, I'm for not operating that. system, you know, program verification, operating system verification. None of them. I mean, I've not kept up with that field, but until last ten years, ten years ago, nothing was done. No, no, for so software, it hasn't worked. For hardware verification, it has worked. So that's ah, a, that's because just say, you know, that's because you are talking about basic logical operations. Then it will work. If you are talking about you know ones and zeros and digitals, then it will work. No, but there also there are I mean, limited reasoning of a certain uh, kind. I, I, I no, just, to the I extent that you, you can get down to the pure logic you're doing of a silicon logic of one and zero binary, Ahmed, yes you can. Ahmed, you go beyond that. <laughs> no, but that's you're what you're saying. That's yeah, these are things you can't do. You're doing a disservice to your to your profession. Everybody <laughs> in this room creates symbolic representations, and everybody who creates them ought to understand the limits of the hardware that manipulates those representations. Yeah, so that's the point. That, that's the way I, I look at it. <laughs> yeah. It basically and says that, hey, here are things that you cannot do. So if you really want to do something along these lines, go for approximation algorithms, and, go and, for all the hacks. But now you're justifying. The, and uh, another the thing, thing is, we or, have or you can shy, shy back and do simple things, which is OK, great. I, 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 mean, I, I came to realize this limitation a long time ago and then say, not worry about it. Yeah. No, no, that I can no, say of anything. No, but, I mean, I, I can say, I, I mean, <laughs> no, but at, at least now you, you have a good that. reason to believe it. You can always shy away and say, OK, I'm not going to do it. I mean, that's OK. No, but that, that is another case is we have to all, this gives us a reason to understand that what we do heuristically yeah. is not truth. Yeah. We are, we, I mean, we are trying to reach near a model, but it's, it's not, we can go wrong in this heuristic based it's, as well. It's, it's not probably absolute truth. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, who cares? No. I mean, we, we need to care about it. No, because I mean, I, I, for why should I care that Earth goes around the sun? I mean, I don't care. They have <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to care, right? <laughs> I mean, I get my day every day. No, no, no. I don't need to know. There, I don't need to know. There are 
there's two things. One is there is a direct implication, probably what you look for. And there are some Copernicus kind of things people, uh, where they said, okay, uh, 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 Earth goes around the sun and not... Uh, uh, no, sun goes around the Earth. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 Copernicus, Copernicus said uh, Earth goes around the sun. Yeah, no, no, but, but I'm yeah. saying that the other so one now, I'm also, I don't There was no know. implications at that point of time, but the, the if you see the sequence of events that has taken place after that, mm. That is very uh, different. Make than the connection of that with uh, Godel's in uh, completeness? No, the kind of verification uh, strategies which have been designed after that mm. yeah. are very different. The history of science. Yeah. History and of science? Yes, yes. Okay. Are we, we are doing history right now? <laughs> 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 By the way, uh, Amir and Monere are going to present the th uh, basis of modern AI. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, in a, they ground the modern AI into this uh, binary logic Good. and first row logic. Okay, we'll see that. <laughs>